Hi there, my name is Vic Veer. I'm an ENT surgeon working for the NHS in central London. And I want to tell you about something that I put together with my friend, one of the senior nurses at uh, Queen's Hospital in Romford in Essex, uh, Mr. Mark Churchill. Now, together, what we decided to do is try and make theatres, uh, operating theatres in our hospital far more efficient. Because what was going on is that uh, we could only get about, say, four short cases each morning in through our operating list. The trouble is our waiting list was getting longer and we were always trying to play catch up and trying to work on weekends and it was just not sustainable. So Mark Churchill and I worked out a way that we could triple the amount of patients going through a theatre in the same day whilst remaining safe. And I just want to tell you how we did this over the last, I think, five years or so. The first thing we worked out was that these short operations that were going on most of the time was based on the anaesthetic time, so the going to sleep and waking the patient back up again, rather than the operating time. And that's where we thought we could make the most gains. By way of an example, what I'll do is I'll tell you what we are doing at the moment. In the operating theatre, actually, I'll move over here so you can, actually, I'll move over here. Um, over here will be a, a diagram of an operating theatre, which is actually two rooms in England. I think it's slightly different in America. You have a room down here, which is uh, the anaesthetic room, where patients come in at the, the start of a list. They've seen the anaesthetist, and then there's a little cannula that goes in their arm or the back of their hand, and they get given some oxygen, and they're given some anaesthetic, and they fall asleep, but a tube goes into their throat. And once they're anaesthetized, ready for an operation, they're then wheeled around to another room, which is up here, called the operating room. And that's where a surgeon like myself is sitting there. And we then um, start the operation in that room. And once the operation is finished, they're just wheeled out and back to a room called the recovery room. And then once the anaesthetist has woken up that patient who's just been operated on, they come back and start the next. And the process goes round and round in this circle. And it works very well. It's very safe. We have lots of safeguards and, and, and there's no problem with that. Except if you have a very short operation, say 10, 15 minutes, almost 45 minutes is taken up getting the patient to sleep and waking them up, uh, back up again. So in a four hour list, you'd only get four of these operations done, but you've only operated for 40 minutes. And so we tried a different method. Now, before I get onto it, I need to say that the different method is not just like speeding everything up, because if you do that, we felt, or at least Mark Churchill and I felt that it would cause errors, it would cause problems. And that's the last thing you want when you're dealing with a patient who is anaesthetized and having an operation. You don't want there to be errors. You don't want there to be problems. You don't want people to get stressed. So instead, it's exact, almost exactly the same process. Uh, again, I'll put it back here. Anaesthetist um, brings in a patient and gets anaesthetized in this room. That patient then gets wheeled into the operating room and then the surgeon myself will start operating on that patient. At that point, another anaesthetist brings in another patient into the anaesthetic room and you have to time this just right. So they bring that patient in and start the process of putting the line in the arm and giving the patient some oxygen, at which point at the same time I'm in the operating theatre and I'm just about to finish, the anaesthetist then starts waking up the patient and moves them around to the recovery room. At the same time, this anaesthetist, a separate anaesthetist altogether, will bring in, well, there's a five minute gap between patients because you need to clean the floor and the, the surgeon needs to write the notes and needs to prescribe the going home medication and, and all those sorts of things. And we have to change our gloves and things like that. But there is about five, six minutes where we're doing all that. Once the, 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 the first patient's come out, the second patient comes straight in with another set of anaesthetists as well. So uh, that person comes in and the surgeon goes right back uh, with a five minute break to start the next operation. Whilst that operation is going, the anaesthetist that's just gone round with the first patient will come back and start the next patient. So you, it's a lot of sort of careful timing between the two anaesthetists. So instead of just being one anaesthetist, you've doubled the number of anaesthetists, uh, but it makes a difference because it means that the operation theatre suite has been used far more effectively. Rather than being a, a 45 minute gap, you're, you're dealing with just a five, 10 minute gap in between patients. In the theatre itself, you only need one surgeon because they're just um, operating, doing their notes, and then coming back to sit down with new gloves on to start the next operation. 
you probably do need some extra staff in theatre as well, because the idea is that you keep going round and round, but it's when staff, uh, nurses, scrub teams and, and the runner and all those sorts of people in theatre, it's when you start giving too many jobs to uh, different people or they keep swapping jobs. Mark Churchill particularly worked out that as long as everyone has a role and sticks to that role all day, there are very few mistakes in this situation. So if you're the person that brings the patient back and forth between recovery or the ward to the, um, the anaesthetic room, that's your job for the day. If you're the uh, nurse that's going to um, stand next to the surgeon and give him his instruments or, uh, and operate and then move those instruments away, make sure everything's counted up at the end, that's your job for the whole day. You don't swap and chop and change all the way through. Everyone knows their job. Everyone sticks to it. It can be, it sounds very monotonous, but actually if everything's working in tandem, everyone's working like a sort of well-oiled machine, it, it, it gives you a sense of real achievement at the end of it. Now, I think it's very, very important. And I think this is probably the most important uh, message of this video is that you should not rush through these operations. You should not rush any element of the process that we normally do with looking after patients when they have their operation. Because now I guess I'm speaking more to surgeons and other doctors now, because those people will look at this video and go, ah, oh, no, it can't be done. There's no way. Uh, because I'm talking about, instead of doing say four tonsillectomies in the morning, which is about average, I'm thinking about doing 12 or or should I say, you know, coming up to almost 30 in a day between eight till five o'clock at night, uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. So that seems like an awful lot, but I've done this now uh, four or five times by myself. Uh, on those four occasions, I got through 100 tonsillectomies relatively easily. Um, I start late at about nine o'clock because I was seeing all these patients, so it took me a lot longer. I'd have an hour and a half lunch break uh, and I'd finish almost early each time as well. So it is fine. It works very well. Um, and I can, but I, I can appreciate that a lot of people go, it can't be done. It can't be done. That's ridiculous. There's no way it won't be safe. It's dangerous. And lots of doctors said the same thing to me when I uh, proposed this idea for other people too, because I did this 2018, 2019, and couldn't do it over COVID, obviously. But I kept showing people the results and loads of people tried to shut Mark and I down and said, no, this is dangerous, don't do it. But when we showed people the results, and particularly when we showed NHS England, who have now told everyone in the NHS about this and other people are starting to do it, it's not as scary and as worrying as, as it sounds. And it may be some people say, oh no, it's just because you're a very quick surgeon. It's not that. I'm not a quick surgeon. I'm not quicker than anyone else. And to prove it, what I said was, uh, the, the most recent incarnation of this is I got everyone in our department, all the ENT surgeons in our department. Some of us are quicker than the others. It doesn't matter. What I said was, I do not want you to operate any quicker or any slower in this, in this operating day. I want you to just do your thing, take your time, do it right the first time, just as you would on a normal day. Let the system around you work. And to the anaesthetist, I said the same thing. Look, I don't want you to just pull out the tube or ram in the tube really quickly. I want you to do the safest possible, good quality medicine, anaesthesia that you can um, do. The same thing with the nurses. Everyone does their own thing. It's just a lot of staff are doubled up. So people are in their own little silos and it's working together very efficiently to get patients in and out. And it feels a bit like a factory because you're going through very quickly but what you're doing is, because we've doubled up a lot of the staff, you are, you're providing good quality care well uh, in your individual patients. This is another set of people looking after the other set of patients. So it's not as bad as it looks. And, and I did say just a second ago that I got everyone in our department to do the same thing. Now, a lot of them said, just as I'm sure some doctors looking at this will say, it can't be done in our hospital, it will never happen or whatever. Um, and I said to those people, look, this is the first time you're trying it. Don't, um, what I don't want you to do is get stressed about the day. If you can't do 24, 25, 30 patients in a day, why don't you just stick to 16 or even, I don't know, 15, 14? And if you're worried about it, then I think you're going to stress yourself out. That's going to lead to worse results. I want you to go into this feeling not stressed at all. And the uh, hospital um Queen's Hospital in Romford very kindly said that 
if you overrun, we will pay you for that overrun. So there was no worry that, oh, I'm saying late and all this sort of stuff. So um, they had that security that uh, they can stay late and if they need to, if they're running very late, if something happened during the day. And, and these are the things that most surgeons worry about. They're worried about patients waiting a long time, all that sort of thing. But actually, every single doctor in our department, including some of the juniors, also all did this method for a whole week and everyone finished on time. No one overran. Everyone did really well. Everyone over doubled their output. Um, some people um, asked for just 16, uh, which is fine because they weren't stressed and they, they felt at the end, actually, although I've worked quite hard, I feel really good about myself and and the nurses feel good about this. So the nurses feel like they've done a really good job and it feels like we've done an awful lot for these patients, for the NHS, for the hospital. Uh, so, for example, uh, on that week when we did, I can't remember, almost 100 tonsillectomies between us as a team, we got through quite a lot of our waiting list. I can't remember how many, um, uh, how much of the waiting list we got through. But in one week, which would normally, the waiting list grows each week, we managed to bring it down by a third or something like that. And it made a huge difference to our patients who came through as well. And the hospital also benefits. The hospital always benefits, but it's like it's like the casino always benefits. But in these situations, because we've got through a lot of patients in one day safely, and because the 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 safety ratings were very good, that there was no increase in the number of bleeds, there's no increase in the number of post-op complications, etc. Uh, we checked all of these things afterwards, and I've been checking sort of all my operations over the last five years. There wasn't an increase in these times when I did these very fast lists or um, three X lists or whatever people want to call them. Um, we found that in those days, even though we've doubled up some of the staff, even though um, we, we were paid overtime in, um, if we went over six o'clock, and a lot of us were paid overtime to work those extra hours just in case it ran over, even though all those things were going on, the hospital still made an extra £14,000 from each operating list, which is a huge amount. Most times in the NHS, we break even on an operating list. We, we, we barely succeed to make any money for, for the hospital. But in these situations, the hospital made £14,000, including all the consumables and all these other things I told you about. So it made a huge difference. And the managers obviously loved us for it because they said, oh my God, we've got through the waiting list. We've made money. Everyone's happy because they've felt like they've done a really good job over this week. Let's do it again. <laughs> um, and I can see some doctors looking at this and going, well, actually, hang on. You're asking us to work three times as hard for the same amount of pay. And yeah, I do. I, I get that. That's a problem with this, this um, with the NHS uh, and, and how we work. We're not incentivized for working hard. Uh, there are a lot of doctors out there, um, as with any profession, who will work the absolute minimum, but they will get as paid as much as the hardest working doctor. It, it's not fair in that sense. Uh, really, we should be working by results or the number of patients we go through and all that sort of stuff. But it's not how the NHS works. We work for the unit of time rather than how much pro how productive we are. But that's a separate issue. I personally don't use it as a I'm going to do every list like this every week because it's quite hard to maintain. What I tend to use these um, super lists for are to get through my very short operations. Getting through my short operations means I, I go through a lot of short operations very quickly and get through 20, 30 of these ones because what I don't want to do is try and squeeze it into my normal waiting, my normal operating list. So, for example, I tend at Queen's Hospital Romford, I tend to do lots of ear operations, mastoidectomy operations, where I'm drilling into the skull, around the back of the ear, around the hearing apparatus, the little bones of hearing, all those sorts of things. I don't want to have to think to myself during those rather difficult operations, oh, I've got to get that tonsil done, or that, that poor kid's grommets need to be done. And all these little short operations, you don't want to cancel people. And that causes some stress. Whereas if you have a bit of control of your waiting list and you can say, look, I'll do one of these lists, if it means that I can allocate an adequate amount of time for these rather than trying to squeeze in patients in between. So you end up doing a short operation, a long operation, try and squeeze one short operation at the end. Hopefully it won't overrun. If it does, don't worry, we'll just cancel the patient. That feels terrible. The managers aren't the ones that go to the uh, recovery suite 
even though the managers tell you you've got to cancel that patient, I'm the one who has to go to um, the day surgery and say, look, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones or Mr. Smith or whatever, we've run out of time, I have to cancel the operation, I'm so sorry. Then patients shout at me and it's not my fault, I'm trying really hard. Um, and it's just that conversation that all surgeons hate. But at least this way, you can manage your own lists and you can say, dear management, I'd like to do this, get through my uh, this list this way, it'll make the hospital some money, it'll free me up to run my list as I wish and you have a bit more control. And Having control over your waiting list is really important. Anyway, since I've said this, it's not just the ENT department have done this. My friend Neil Shah in the maxillofacial surgery department, who runs that department, I think he did like 32 cancer sort of skin operations in one day, which is amazing. You know, getting through that many cancers in one day is fantastic. I think the urologists did, I think, 24 uh, cancer, I'm not sure what type of operations, but they did loads of operations as well. I've seen news reports of other people around the country doing similar things. I'm kind of proud that uh, this is this sort of idea is taken off. I'm not, I, I don't think this is a new concept. We used to do this quite a lot when I was a junior doctor. Uh, I think this video is slowing down now, but I hopefully you found that useful, particularly doctors who are thinking about starting this process and taking control of their waiting lists and helping patients with their operations and getting on top of your, um, on your list so that you're not making patients wait so long. Uh, and I hope this will help lots of patients out there. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.